40 here, and I think here in the 40-verse, we are particularly well prepared for what's going on in Europe, what's going on with Vladimir Putin, because for years we've been talking about the realist approach to politics, the realist approach to life, the realist approach to reality and morality, the realist approach to international relations, the realist approach to Torah study, right? <laughs> trying to stay in reality is the ongoing theme of this show. And we use a lot of theories to try to simplify and get at the essence of reality in a particular area. So sometimes for a quarterback, knowing, you know, who's the Mike linebacker, all right, that's, that's the, your magic key for decoding what kind of defense you're going to be facing. And uh, sometimes you can just tell by how quick people are in response. You can get a good read of their IQ. And in a certain situations, n knowing someone's cranial capacity, their, their cognitive capacity, that's the magic key for trying to assess a situation. Now we are looking at uh, Vladimir Putin. What does he want? Surely it's a lot more than just Ukraine. And does what Putin wants, is that the same? Is that coterminous with what Russia wants. Is what's good for Vladimir Putin good for Russia? And of course, it's not going to be exactly equal. Coterminous. So it seems to me that overall, uh, Vladimir Putin has been a highly effective leader of Russia. But individuals' incentives are not identical to the incentives of the corporation or of the nation state. Whoa, sat next to an economist who specialized in analyzing corporate boards and what are the incentives for corporate board members and how are they different from the incentives for corporations, right? So, for example, Vladimir Putin is about 69, 70 years of age. It's not going to be around forever. He wants a legacy. And Putin is... Make some kind of flashy splash, make dramatic uh, gestures to try to establish their reputation, to try to burnish their reputation. But many of the things we do to burnish our individual reputations are not necessarily good for the groups that we represent. So try to figure out the audio here. Let's get a little Professor John J. Mearsheimer. International realities. In 2020, Professor Mearsheimer won the James Madison Award which is given once every three years by the American Political Science Association to an American political scientist who has made a distinguished scholarly contribution to political science. So John Mearsheimer has been talking about how this Ukraine crisis is primarily the West's fault because it's equivalent to you push and push someone, all right? You push their buttons, you make them feel unsafe, you invade territory that they believe it should be theirs, and then you're all shocked and appalled when they react. And that's essentially what the West has done. They have kept moving NATO closer and closer to the borders of Russia, making Russia feel threatened, naturally, normally, because the United States has its own Monroe Doctrine. We don't like it when, when uh, the Soviet Union was in Cuba. We would not like it if China got involved in the Americas. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So John Mearsheimer makes the argument that... Uh, it's the West who caused this crisis in the Ukraine. Thanks. Professor Mearsheimer, it is an honor to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I wish I was not uh, here virtually, but that I was physically at Cambridge. Uh, I'd actually love to come to Cambridge sometime uh, and talk to you and, and to meet people, go to lunch, go to dinner. Uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, I understand these virtual talks are a good second best, but nevertheless, they are a second best. Uh, Tom asked me to talk for about 20 minutes on the whole subject of the Ukraine crisis, uh, which I, of course, have written about and talked about extensively since 2014. So I'm happy to do that, and I'll answer questions on Ukraine, and I'm willing to answer questions on uh, almost any subject uh, you folks would like to talk about. Uh, let me do two things. First, let me talk about 
the origins uh, and the history of this crisis. So I've been playing Mearsheimer for five, six, seven years now, right? He is the preeminent theorist of offensive realism. So there are various schools in international relations for theory, and there are various schools for the international relations theory of realism. He focuses on offensive realism, that what's most important in trying to understand the capabilities of a nation state are what are its offensive capabilities. Like how much damage can they do? So I love the analogy. I think it's from Mishima that we're essentially all locked in an iron cage together, right? And there's no higher authority coming to bail us out and to adjudicate our disputes, right? Nation states are like rival drug gangs. And I've used this analogy over and over again for years, right? If you make a drug deal and it goes wrong, you can't call the police, you can't invoke the courts, you can't sue anyone, right? You are operating above and beyond normal legal procedures. And in international relations, you are operating above and beyond normal legal procedures because, yeah, even though there are things called international law, it doesn't really matter much unless countries with power decide to enforce international law. So we're all locked in an iron cage together and we can never be sure of anyone's intentions because we don't even fully know our own intentions because our own intentions are constantly changing based on our own capabilities, our own energy, our own alliances, right? The amount of power that we can muster, our own mood, and what, what are the opportunities that are presented before us. And uh, then talk about why it's on the front burner today. Uh, and then let me say a few words in conclusion about where we're headed. Uh, the conventional wisdom in the West, and this is certainly true in a place like Britain and the United States, is that Putin is responsible for this crisis. It, it's the Russians. And uh, the chat says, what's the difference, bro? No one listens to John Mearsheimer. It's not like any politician listens to him. Biden and Harris definitely don't listen to him. So yeah, President Joe Biden's political weakness, his low standing in the polls, his lack of effectiveness during his uh, 13 months in power, that makes him particularly susceptible to doing the silly, stupid things that he's doing, such as sending more US troops to Europe, sending troops to Poland, and putting more importance on this situation than it necessarily deserves. So. Biden is doing the wrong thing because he's so weak politically. He's trying to shore up his standing because he doesn't want to be accused of, oh, Biden, he's the guy who, who lost Ukraine. And John F. Kennedy plunged us into the Cuban Missile Crisis for similar reasons. He was facing a very difficult midterm election in the fall of 1962, and he wanted to rob the Republicans of the argument that, that John F. Kennedy and the Democrats were weak on defense. And so as a result, he brought this world closer to nuclear war than it ever happened before, in large part to shore up his political standing, right? So a lot of what happens in the world is in part because of individuals, though overall, I think structure is more important than individuals. So yes, individuals matter, individuals face incentives. So any politician faced with the incentives of a midterm election where they were facing like devastating blowback would would be very inclined to do all sorts of things in international relations that would necessarily be against their country's interest but might be in their party's interest and in their personal interest so the structure and the situation affects the incentives that individuals operate under so u.s policy vis-a-vis -vis ukraine would not be that different if Donald Trump was in office, if Joe Biden was in office, if Tulsi Gabbard was in office, if Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was in office, because the structure of international relations is that we're all locked in this iron cage together. We don't know other people's capabilities or motivations, and so we are strongly incentivized to try to come across as strong as possible. But if we operate under this strong incentive, it just doesn't mean anything that we do that we think will make us stronger. Many of the things that we do to make us stronger personally or as a community or as a nation state end up making us weaker. So Putin invading Ukraine may end up being the death knell of Russia and the death knell of Putin. 
they're good guys and bad guys. And of course, we are the good guys and the Russians are the bad guys. This is simply wrong. Uh, the United States mainly, but the United States and its allies are responsible for this crisis, not Putin and Russia. Now, why do I say that? Very important to understand that what the West has been trying to do since 2008 is turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark. And not just that, all sorts of U.S. politicians have said we need a revolution in Russia. In other words, overthrow the Russian regime. Uh, mainly Democratic politicians uh, have said this. And of course, that's going to push Putin into a, a corner. That's going to be a threat. And when people are under threat, they don't tend to react calmly, right? When, when you push people and put them under threat, well, they tend to react in, in more extreme ways than they would without the threats. So this is uh, John Mearsheimer here talking about the situation in Russia and Ukraine. And why are we playing Mearsheimer? Hey, the politicians don't listen to him. Well, it's important to try to understand what's going on and to understand the world around us you need theory right theories are simplified pictures of reality and john mishima wrote a long paper in 2014 about the virtues of theory because theories explain how the world works in particular domains right there's a theory for what do you do when the defense is playing too high safeties right there are theories about that and there are theories about the capacity of cognitive uh, measurements to predict how how groups will operate in, in the real world. So this is from uh, John Mearsheimer's 2014 essay. The world around us is is blooming and buzzing confusion. All right, it's infinitely complex. It's difficult to comprehend and to make sense of what's happening in the world around us. We need theories. We need to decide which factors matter most. Right. So we have to leave many factors out because they are less important for explaining what's going on. So theories make the world comprehensible because they help us zero in on what's most important. So theories are like maps. Maps are not exact replicas of reality. Maps distort reality, but they are good enough usually, right? Maps and theories simplify a complex reality so that we can grasp what's most important, right? You can have a highway map of the United States. It could include major cities, roads, rivers, mountains, and lakes, but it would leave out many less prominent features such as individual trees and buildings or the rivets on the Golden Gate Bridge, all right? So like a theory, a map is an abridged version of reality. Now, unlike maps, theories provide a causal story. So theories say one or more factors can explain a particular phenomenon. So theories are built on simplifying assumptions about which factors matter the most for explaining how the world works. So realist theories hold the balance of power considerations account for the outbreak of great power wars and the domestic politics has less explanatory power. So whether or not a nation goes to war doesn't really matter much whether it's a democracy or an authoritarian or a totalitarian state. It's balance of power considerations. It's the structure of international relations and the relative strengths and weaknesses of the nation states at under consideration that are most important. So theories boil things down to variables or concepts. So a theory will say how key concepts are defined. They will make assumptions about key actors. And theories will identify how independent, intervening, and dependent variables fit together, which then enables one to infer. Time when it comes to international relations. Now, they're not universal, right? They apply only to particular times and particular spaces. And the scope of a theory can vary significantly. You can have grand theories such as realism or liberalism, which purport to explain whole broad patterns of state behavior. All right, let's get back here to John Mishaima. On Russia's border. And that policy had three dimensions to it. 
The first and most, most important is NATO expansion. The idea was that we were gonna expand NATO eastward to include Ukraine. The second element of the strategy was EU expansion. So in other words, it was not just NATO expansion that was gonna go and include Ukraine, it was also EU expansion. And the third element of the strategy was the color revolution. Uh, and in the case of Ukraine, that was the orange revolution. And the idea was to turn Ukraine into a liberal democracy like Britain, like the United States. And not only a liberal democracy, but a liberal democracy that was allied with the United States. Because again, this is all part and parcel of a strategy that is designed to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. Now, as I said to you, the most important element of the strategy is NATO expansion. And that's why the April 2008 Bucharest NATO summit is of immense importance. So whether it's the United States that controls Ukraine or Ukraine controls Ukraine, or Putin controls Ukraine or Russia controls Ukraine, it doesn't really have that much significance for the United States, right? There isn't a whole lot of, you know, particularly valuable stuff in the Ukraine directly for the United States. But by pushing NATO right up to the borders of Ukraine, you put Russia under pressure. When people are under pressure, they react in unpredictable ways. And so we're increasing the odds of of war with Russia, we're increasing the odds of some kind of nuclear exchange. We're dramatically increasing the odds of bad things happening to us because we put Russia under pressure. And now we've got all these variables at play and we don't know which ones are going to explode. At the end of that April 2008 Bucharest summit, NATO announced that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. They said, this is going to happen, period. The Russians made it unequivocally. So I like democracy compared to an authoritarian state. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather live in a democracy, but it doesn't mean that democracy is the cure for all ills. All right. Democracy is not the cure for great power politics conflict. And I like religion, but religion makes some people worse. Uh, religion isn't going to solve every problem. So religion properly lived out makes some people better and makes m some communities better. But religion sometimes makes people and, and communities worse. And I like to study history, right? But the study of history is not going to solve all our problems either. So the world's infinitely complex. And many of the things that are, say, good for us personally or the type of regime that we want to live under does not necessarily translate into other situations. Clear at that point that that is not gonna happen. They drew a line in the sand. As you all know, there were two big tranches of NATO expansion before that 2008 meeting. The first tranche of NATO expansion was in 1999. That included Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. So if you don't know a lot and you live in the West, you think NATO is a great thing. And NATO, when facing the threat of the Soviet Union, NATO was a great way for Western and Central Europe to band together to try to halt any possible expansion of the Soviet Union. Okay, time and place, NATO was great. Right now, or particularly since 1993, when NATO has steadily expanded, NATO has become a detriment to U.S. security. We would be much better being out of NATO. And one of the problems with this conflict of the Ukraine is that it gives NATO a reason for being. Uh, under Donald Trump, NATO was simply withering away. And we have steadily shifted resources out of NATO into Far East, Northeast Asia, and, and somewhat to, to the Middle East. We don't have any vital national security interests in Europe anymore, but now we're getting sucked back into Europe in large part because Joe Biden is so politically weak and he doesn't want to look uh, as though he, he's a wimp. So he's trying to look tough, even though the way he's doing it is against American interests. Then there was a second tranche in 2004, which included countries like Romania uh, and the Baltic states and so forth and so on. 
The Russians swallowed those two NATO expansions. They intensely disliked both of them, but they swallowed them. When NATO said in 2008 that expansion would now include Georgia and Ukraine, the Russians drew a line in the sand. It's very important to understand that. They said, this is not happening. It is no accident. It's it's similar to a lot of other things, like a certain amount of religion may be good for a person, but more religion than that turns them into a freak. Uh, a certain amount of exercise can be good. Too much exercise can be harmful. A certain amount of water is good. You drink too much water, it can have great harm. So everything is proportionate. Everything depends on context. And so NATO, when it was facing the Soviet Union, pretty good uh, mechanism. But... NATO now, it's a detriment to U.S. national security. Accident ...that in August of 2008, a few months after the April 2008 Bucharest summit, you had a war between Russia and Georgia. Remember, Georgia is the other country besides Ukraine that is going to be brought into NATO. The Russians said, that ain't happening. And another big problem with our national security industry is... What type of people go into international relations? What type of people go into the State Department? You know, what type of people are particularly interested in America's relations with the world? Okay, people who want to make a difference. People who want to make a name for themselves. Right? People who want to feel important. We all want to feel important. People going into international relations from an American perspective, they have led to America being much more involved overseas than is in America's interests, but you know, standing up to Putin, or you know, working some special deal so that you know, Ukraine has uh, you know a different type of government, just like we did in 2014 when we shifted the power in Ukraine, we we contributed to a shift in Ukrainian power from someone who was a, a Putin puppet to someone who was not a Putin puppet, and it's all very exciting when you're pulling the strings behind the scenes and you're moving you know this person into power and you're taking that person out of out of power and you're getting the united states you know deep into involvement in africa and in eastern europe right it's all very exciting for people who are professional diplomats and people in you know the international relations community right who who are getting paid to you know pull these machinations right so it's very exciting for these individuals, not so good for the American national interest. And you had a war. In it's a little bit like in real life streamers, people going down the street and being obnoxious, right? It can be compelling video, but it's bad for the community as a whole, right? It deteriorates uh, social trust and social cohesion to have people going down the street saying obnoxious things. August, 2008. In February, February 22nd, to be exact, February 22nd, 2014, the crisis broke out over Ukraine. And it was mainly precipitated by a coup in Ukraine that overthrew a pro-Russian leader and installed a pro-American leader. The United States was involved in that right so america installs a pro-american leader it sounds wonderful right but installing a pro-american leader could uh, rebound on us in, in negative ways it's like uh, the alt-right when they move from a movement that was primarily online into in real life activism they destroyed the movement right so sometimes you don't want to go into in real life activism sometimes you don't want to install uh, leaders who are pro-american or pro group your group because for every action there's there are reactions at coup. The Russians went ballistic. This is hardly surprising. They went ballistic. And uh, Ricardo says, isn't Putin a great friend of the oligarchs? He's a great friend of some oligarchs as long as they do what he wants. And he's a, a sworn enemy and a destroyer of other oligarchs. And they did two things. First is they took Crimea from Ukraine. Why did they do that? You understand that there is a very... It's like someone at work who oversteps his authority. And let's say he doesn't get fired, 
but he gets his wings trimmed, right? His responsibilities are reduced. His power is reduced. It, maybe his pay is reduced. So the West overstepped in Ukraine and they got their wings clipped. Important naval base called Sevastopol on Crimea. And there's no way the Russians are going to let Sevastopol become a NATO naval base. This is not going to happen. That's the principal reason that the Russians took Crimea. And the second thing that they did is that the Russians... And a question in the chat, is it true that Ukraine is Russian? Parts of Ukraine are heavily Russian, and other parts of the Ukraine lean more towards the West. Russians took advantage of a civil war that broke out in eastern Ukraine almost immediately after the February 22nd, 2014 crisis. So one of the, when, when I have been like physically threatened or physically assaulted, I, I don't think I've fought back at least since grade school, because you never know how these things are going to escalate. So if, if I fight back, yeah, maybe, you know, I'd be more of a man and I'd, I'd feel better about myself and maybe, you know, other people would be less likely to pick on me, but you're also escalating the situation so that, you know, someone could get really hurt. So I could face criminal charges or I could get really hurt. And so the West, by pushing right up to Russia's door, they've escalated the situation, put Putin and Russia under pressure. And when people lash out from that perspective, you never know what's going to happen. But you've dramatically increased the odds of something terrible happening for you. And what the Russians have done is they have fueled that civil war and they have made sure that their allies, who are mainly Russian speakers and in many cases Russian, in eastern Ukraine are not defeated by the Ukrainian government. They, in effect, are wrecking Ukraine. The Russians are basically saying, we will wreck Ukraine before we... Civilization hangs by such a narrow thread. All right, so anything that diminishes social cohesion and social trust is terrible because it's so hard to build up social cohesion and social trust. In the San Fernando Valley, right, people walked around in the 1960s without locking their cars, without locking their homes, right, without installing all sorts of uh, security equipment, right, because it was safe then. But after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you got this explosion in crime what came with it was a destruction in social cohesion and social trust. And now we've, we've got, uh, since the Ferguson effect in 2014, we had another explosion in crime and then the Black Lives Matter uh, terrorism of 2020, another massive explosion in crime. And we're just hacking away at social trust and social cohesion. And it's so difficult to build it up, right? It's so easy to wreck civilization. It's so hard to maintain civilization. And one of the ways you, you maintain civilization is by trying to ensure that there's trust between people and the more that people have in common, right? The more likely people are to cohere and to have trust with each other. So that's why diversity is such a threat to civilization because diversity means that it's a great thing that we have very little in common with our fellow citizens. And it's so hard to come back from that decohering of a society which we've had in large parts of the United States, particularly since the 1960s, through excessive amounts of immigration and a whole new constitution whereby certain groups are sacralized and they're not held to the same moral standards as other groups. We allow Ukraine to become a member of NATO. So the Russian response, it's very important to understand this, in 2014, when the crisis first broke out into the open in response to what had happened in Bucharest in 2008, the Russian response was twofold. Number one, they took Crimea. And you should all understand Crimea is gone. It is never going back to Ukraine, one. And number two, they have said implicitly that we will destroy Ukraine we will wreck it before we will let it become a member of NATO. Now, the question you want to ask yourself is, why are the Russians doing this? This is Realpolitik 101. 
And the fact that people in the West, especially in places like Britain and the United States. So realism means that people aren't simply motivated by nice sounding things, right? I love people, but I also contain the capacity for hatred, right? I can be cuddly, but I can also be quite nasty, all right? And that's just, that's just the, the human condition. And realism accepts uh, the reality of human nature that a lot of what drives us is really nasty. And yeah, it'd be great if every, you know, everyone was a Democrat, small d, and if we all live together in peace and tolerance, right? But that's just not how people operate. Don't understand this. Boggles my mind. I just don't understand it. The idea that you could take a military alliance run by the United States, the most powerful state in the world, and run it up to Russia's borders, and the Russians wouldn't be bothered by it, is simply unthinkable. And uh, Ricardo says, Luke, what would it take to convince Americans to mobilize for war again? Ukraine certainly isn't it. Correct. And uh, Taiwan, no chance. Well, the decision to militarily support Taiwan has already been made. So a lot of foreign policy decisions and a lot of decisions about where we send troops and where we send military assets do not depend on popular approval or, or agreement. The American president has essentially all the foreign policy rights that King George III had in 18th century England. Uh, the American president can send troops wherever he wants. He can launch nuclear weapons, right? Every democracy contains considerable elements of dictatorship, and every dictatorship contains considerable elements of non-dictatorship. So when dictators don't perform, when the situation changes so that their decisions look bad, then they frequently get overthrown. So we, we live in, in a complicated world. The U.S. is militarily engaged to support Taiwan, and it doesn't really matter whether uh, the people are behind it or not. So a lot of decisions are just made by an elite and uh, popular will doesn't really play that much into it. So we're not going to risk American soldiers in large numbers to defend Taiwan, but we have all sorts of military assets that will defend Taiwan. We in the United States have the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine says that no distant great power is allowed to form a military alliance with a country in the Western Hemisphere and is certainly not allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis very well. What happened there is the Soviets put nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. The United States... And that wasn't the only thing that happened there. John F. Kennedy was facing a very tough midterm election, and he had all sorts of incentives to appear tough. Incentives that did not correlate exactly with what was in America's best interests. So here's a little bit more from this excellent John Mearsheimer 2014 essay about the virtue of theory. So theories provide overarching frameworks. They give us the big picture of what's happening in a very complicated and buzzing and blooming reality. Right? There's no way to understand an infinitely complex world just by collecting facts. So Carl von Clausewitz said this, anyone who thought it necessary or even useful to begin the education of a future general with a knowledge of all the details has always been scoffed at as a ridiculous pedant. Right? No activity of the human mind is possible without a certain stock of ideas. In other words, we need theories. So theories provide us with economical explanations for what's going on. They help us to understand, to interpret by just taking out of buzzing, blooming, confusing reality, just certain key variables, right? So in, in economics, you have, you know, Keynesianism or monetarism or rational expectations or behavioral economics and international relations scholars array their theories as isms for the similar reason. So the more complicated, the more diverse the reality, the more dependent we are on theories, on mental maps to help us navigate the terrain. Right? So international relations has to place a very high value on theory, theories such as realism, because it's trying to make sense of a large and complex universe. So international studies, international studies, IR, international relations, deal with the largest, most complicated social system possible. And it's this complexity that accounts for the diverse range of traditions in the field. So theories revolutionize our thinking. Right? They transform our understanding of what's important. 
and they explained puzzles that made little sense before the theory was available. So consider Charles Darwin's impact on how people think about the origin of human species. And before Darwin published his work on evolution, most people believed that God created all the different species. Darwin's theory undermined that view, caused many people to change their thinking about God, religion, the whole nature of life itself. I can't think of any thinker more influential in the past 200 years than Charles Darwin. I can't think of any book more influential in the past 200 years than The Origin of Species. So theory also enables prediction, right? And we need to predict for, for our daily lives, for making policy, for advancing social science. So we're all constantly trying to make decisions about the future and trying to determine the best strategy for achieving desired goals. We are trying to predict the future. And because much of the future is unknown, we have to rely on theories to predict what is likely to happen if we choose one strategy over another. Theory is essential for diagnosing policy problems and making policy decisions. All right, we have to rely on theory because we're trying to shape the future. We're interested in cause and effect, and that's what theory is all about. So to be concerned with policy is to focus on the intent to produce certain effects. So policy thinking is causality thinking. And theory, fifth, is crucial for effective policy evaluation. So a good theory identifies indicators we can use to determine whether a particular initiative is working. So if your theory of counterinsurgency suggests that the key to victory is killing a large number of insurgents, then body counts are an obvious benchmark for assessing progress. But if one's theory of victory identifies winning hearts and minds as the keys to success, then reliable public opinion polls would be a better indicator. So effective pos policy evaluation depends on good theory. And then theories inform our understanding of the past. Theories enables, enable us to look back at the past and to better understand ourselves and our history. Theory is helpful when the facts are sparse. So in the absence of reliable information, we have little choice but to rely on theory to guide our analysis. So during the Cold War, the dearth of reliable facts about the Soviet Union made it particularly necessary to rely on theory to understand what was going on inside that closed society. So theories are particularly valuable for understanding novel situations, such as the one we're in right now with U Ukraine. We don't have that many historical precedents to guide our thinking. And theory is critical for conducting a valid empirical tests. So social science essentially consists of developing and testing theory. Said this is categorically unacceptable. Military forces from afar are not allowed in the Western Hemisphere. And we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the end result is those missiles were removed. When the Soviets were later talking about building a naval base at Cienfuegos, the United States told them in no uncertain terms, you are not building a naval base at Cienfuegos. Just not going to happen. The United States views the Western Hemisphere as its backyard, and it prohibits distant great powers from coming into its backyard. Well, don't you think the Russians are going to be deeply disturbed by the United States turning Ukraine into a bulwark right on its borders? Of course they are. And the Russians told us that immediately after the Bucharest summit. The Russians made it categorically clear, categorically clear that Ukraine is not going to become part of NATO. But of course, the Americans and their allies did not listen because we believe that we're the good guys. We're a benign hegemon here in the United States, and we can do pretty much anything we want in the world. And for a while, it looked like we could get away with that. As I said, the Russians accepted the first NATO expansion, the 1999 one, and they accepted the second NATO expansion. But after Bucharest, they said, this is not happening. So you had this major crisis that broke out in February 2014. Now, the crisis, the crisis tamped down quite a bit after 2014. Right, we would not be in this crisis right now, probably if Donald Trump was in power. But because Biden feels so weak and because Biden is more wedded to elite opinion, then our, our elites are more interventionist than regular Americans.
because it's it's so exciting and they have the power to you know get involved and to try to change things around the world it uh, provides a sense of meaning and importance and excitement and maybe you get to have you know sex and make money but uh, those incentives don't necessarily align with what's good for the united states of america christopher cordwell has a book review that's uh, just out about lessons from the fall of the soviet union and he talks about how russia became a key factor in the fall of the soviet union when uh, Gorbachev undermined central government, elites in various national Soviet socialist republics from Ukraine to Armenia to Kazakhstan began building up their provincial institutions and they clamored for autonomy and independence. But there was one republic and one republic alone that was lacking in such institutions, Russia. So the Soviet state had been the Russian state. So as Gorbachev's programs began to bite and reforms began to work the ethnic Russians who constituted the Soviet majority sensed that they would need a state too if they wanted to avoid simply being looted among all the Gorbachevian upheaval. So ordinary citizens felt this. A surprising number of Russian intellectuals did as well. They made a choice between the crumbling Soviet monolith and the fledgling Russian nation. And we are in a similar dynamic right now in the United States and, and around the West. So... One of the central paradoxes of contemporary politics is that over solicitousness towards minorities tends to strengthen majority identity and even to bring these majority identities into existence where they had never existed before. So Kamal Ataturk is styled the father of the Turks, not out of sentimentality, but because most people in that part of the world did not think of them as Turks in the early 20th century. So Turks came to realize that they were operating in a post-imperial world and that it was through ethnic identity that power would henceforth be exercised. People thought that uh, as the 2000s rolled along that ethnic identity, racial identity, and religious identity would have less power as the world became more secularized and liberalized. Well, it hasn't worked out that way. And you see this happening again and again and again. In 1949, India, their the, the new constitution was built on the recognition of various castes and minorities. And so a previously undefined majority has in recent years rallied behind the majority Hindu party, right? This is what the elites condemn as Hindu nationalism. But that's what rules India now, Hindu nationalism. In the United States, citizens who do not enjoy special consideration from the government under the 1964 Civil Rights Act and its subsequent evolutions make up the core of Donald Trump's support. And because of that, they get condemned as white nationalists. In Britain, the Scottish, the Irish, and the Welsh get to vote and make their own laws, while English voters have no such prerogative. So you can just look at the Brexit referendum on leaving the European Union to see that question is still a live one. Brexit was soundly defeated in Scotland and Ireland, but it passed by a landslide in those parts of England outside of London. And leave voters in the United Kingdom were accused of English nationalism. Let's get a little more from Mishimer here. 14. But in the fall, in the fall of last year, 2021, it began to ramp up. And of course, early this year, and I'm talking about early 22, it became a full blown crisis. And the question that we want to ask ourselves is what happened here? You know, why, why all of a sudden? Did this crisis go from the back burner to the front burner? And the answer is that the United States and its allies were effectively turning Ukraine into a de facto member of NATO. Uh, you'll hear lots of rhetoric today that the Russians really had nothing to worry about because nobody is talking about making Ukraine a member of NATO today. And I think that's true. Uh, but if you look at what we were actually doing, uh, it's a different story. First of all, going back to the Trump administration and continuing into the Biden administration, we are now arming Ukraine. We were not arming Ukraine during the Obama administration. 
in February 2014 when the crisis broke out. And, and let's say hello to Ricardo. Ricardo, long time no talk. How are you, man? Good. How are you? Good, man. What do you think about what's happening? Oh, you know, I, I tend to agree with you that a lot of this is the reaction to American aggression or expansion. Um, you know, I just, the thing I struggle with is like, yeah, I've come to not really like, you know, particularly the values that America goes around exporting to other countries and the ideological agenda and, and a lot of the rhetorical justifications for why they do things. But is it, you know, the nature, like, once they chose to do the empire thing in 1945, is it kind of like, if you're not growing, then you're just dying, you know? And so the, like, if they don't go into Ukraine and you, you, uh, in other words, like they have no choice, you know, I mean, maybe yeah. we think they have a choice, but they just don't, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, there there are so many factors, but uh, I mean, I, I think it's clear to me that America doesn't have any national security interest in who runs Ukraine. No, I completely agree. I mean, other than, I mean, there is, you know, there are issues of resource flows and um, controlling them. And, you know, the, like this Nord Stream 2 pipeline, you know, if Germany got all of its energy from Russia, Germany would fall into the Russian sphere of influence and maybe America looks at, you know, Ukraine as necessary in, in order to like hold off a domino. Oh, oh, come on, gosh, we're talking about domino theory. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that it's not a real justification, but I guess, you know, maybe they've never gotten over that. Uh, Kyle, what do you think about what's happening in the Ukraine? I think it was, it was a long time coming, but also, um, have to say that Ukrainian leadership is a factor here. Uh, the Ukrainian president has not done a very good job. And just broadly speaking, um, the background to all this is that Russia thought, well, Russia had the Minsk agreements, right? That was an agreement from Ukraine to federalize, meaning to give power to the, the regions yeah. so that Russia could have like a, a graduated buffer state where like the, the, the more eastern parts of Ukraine are kind of Russia aligned, the western parts are west aligned so it's not like a it's not like nato is exactly right on on the furthermost uh you know frontiers of ukraine but instead it was more it was supposed to be more of a compromise but ukraine has just abrogated that compromise totally um and both ukraine and the west believe that there's that has no there's no legitimacy to this agreement signed with uh with putin um and, and in particular this president has really kind of he was elected kind of as, as a moderate, but he, he took a very hard nationalist turn, um, you know, kind of in a similar way to Trump. I think Trump Trump was was elected kind of to, to back away from from um, from foreign involvement, but he ended up being quite quite a hawkish president uh, simply because of, of how uh, domestic affairs boxed him in. Um, I think that I, I don't think Biden is to blame for this. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a very good situation at all. Uh, just like Afghanistan was not a good situation. There are no real good answers for America here. Um, maybe lean on Ukraine, but, uh, you know, lean on Ukraine to, to be con uh, conciliatory to the Russians, maybe, but uh, that that's a big ask. I don't know. Um, uh, Kyle, does, does America have any vital national security interests in Ukraine? Um, or Europe? It's a complicated question. The trend for the last several wars has been for the he who has the largest alliance to win so all these people who say like um oh you know it, it, it's so cuck to be involved you know around the world that's just utterly cuck nothing to do with national interest well the fact is that it connects completely to the most pressing national interest which is not not to be conquered and the reality is that uh, for the last few wars the side with the smaller alliance was conquered so, yes, there is a national interest in Europe and there is a national interest in Ukraine. Um, but, uh, you know, in this particular case, what we've done is we sort of made overtures to Ukraine that we're not willing to, 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 uh, to, to pay up on. And so we've kind of, we've kind of uh, inspired Ukraine to, to 
to act in a way that will get it totally swallowed by Russia, which, which is not good. Like, in, big invasions are, are not good for anybody. Like, they're not good for everybody because that precedent means that you have to spend a lot more on, on deterring it, and it means that it's a lot more likely to happen in the future. Um, but it, I, I think it is a good move for Russia. It's, it's just that it's bad for everybody else. I mean, I think, I think the United States finds itself overextended. It, it is, I, uh, to Kyle's point, it's not necessarily uh, Biden's fault. The, the board has been set long before. But, you know, it seems like the United States is in a situation of, its rep, you know, its reputation with its allies is dependent on it, you know, honoring its commitments. And it is, you know, sort of, incrementally um, entangled itself by making these promises. Um, you know, another thing uh, to the point about, you know, what's in America's interest in regards to maintaining the alliance, um, you know, Rome used to campaign every summer, every year, and they had to every year because they wanted to draw, you know, their, their Latin allies um, into the field along with them so that they could never get restless and, and actually rebel. You know, it's hard for an alliance to break, break up when you're both, you know, engaged in, you know, uh, working closely together on the same side in, in an actual campaign. So it could just be a matter of like the American army basically has to be engaged everywhere in order to, you know, uh, prevent a realignment occurring. Well, I think what's important about most important about this whole story is not Ukraine. It's like, where does Putin go next? Presumably, if Putin takes over Ukraine and then takes some of the, the Baltic states, I mean, I think that's the the most that's the that's the thing that uh, captures my attention. If Putin comes to dominate Ukraine and that's it, then this story d does not have compelling interest for me. It's where does Putin go next? I, I don't think anyone thinks that, uh, Kyle, do you think that Putin would be content with simply swallowing Ukraine? I mean, it reminds me of, of, um, of Hitler, frankly, like just in terms of, I'm not talking morally, I'm just talking in terms of um, strategically, the way Hitler talked before he started the war and, and when he was halfway into the war was like, Oh, I am I'm way too clever to get sucked into like a giant two front war. Like I understand that trope. I am trope aware. I'm not going to I'm not going to get sucked into this. But the person it's kind of like like taking heroin, right? Like the person you become once you once you've had a great success invading another country is not the person that you were you know, when you were considering that that decision, right? Right. It, it, it's yeah. It's that's that's one of the reasons why why it's very bad for everybody else. And why it would be better to have a, a, a solution where that didn't break the precedent that you don't have these, these very large conquests. Uh, one reason why I'd be particularly concerned is that I don't think I don't think that there's going to be like a long insurgency that that hurts Russia. Um, Russia has a lot of advantages over over say like like America occupying occupying Afghanistan. Like um, their secret service or or yeah their secret police know the language of of, of the people they're trying to trying to uh, catch. Uh, this was a lot more cultural commonality. Um, you know, it, it could be very successful, but but that only makes it more dangerous for everybody else besides Russia. And uh, Ricardo, surely it's not Ukraine in and of itself that is of particular interest to you. It's you know, what are the next dominoes to fall after the Ukraine? Well, I I don't really see. I mean, in a way, the Baltic states. Um, Belarusia. I mean, they're they're largely like still within the sphere of of uh, of Russia. They're not, you know, a Soviet republic. But um, I think Ukraine, the Ukraine government. I I don't know that Putin would necessarily take the Western part. Um, maybe it's just a matter of like getting a, a friendly regime there that gives him a buffer. Um, which would seem pretty reasonable to me. I, you know, are they going back into Poland? I don't think that's a realistic possibility, um, especially with nuclear weapons. Like it's just, well, if, that's if too if far outside the bounds. If he wants Poland, uh, I don't think NATO could stop him. I mean, short of nuclear weapons. Well, but I think they might be willing to, I think that, you know, cause here's the thing. It's like, 
when we say like America makes all these promises and commitments, but the current state of affairs are such that like they have blown their load in terms of their ability to convince the United, like the United States people to like mass support a war. You know, they did that with um, in Vietnam and then again in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so nobody's fighting for Ukraine. And if the mercenaries, if the mercenaries aren't enough, then, then Ukraine is, is going to fall to the Russians. And basically Biden, I mean, you know, there was the confusion. I Who knows how much to read into this, but, you know, they're not, uh, they don't want to call this an invasion um, or they're reticent to. And, and they basically have said, like, there, there's nothing. The United States is not going to respond in any meaningful way. And so, um, I, but I do think that Poland would be, it would sort of draw very, so heavily on, like, the World War II mythos. And in, in that Americans and the West generally could, you know, find the will to like actually want to go to war over that. So I'm not sure that's going to happen. Uh, Kyle, any thoughts? Yeah, um, things become pretty unpredictable. I, I broadly agree with Ricardo. I think that um, probably Putin would, would leave a, a sliver of Ukraine, like, like the most hostile Western sliver of Ukraine as like a rump state. And I also don't think that Putin would immediately embark on a, you know, really, really large uh, westward invasion. Um, but just the prospect of it would force a lot of um, a big shift of American troops into that area, and it would like uh, it would create the more of a potential for for misunderstanding. Yeah, it's just kind of it's a uh, it's it's like partly a, a return to the old. Uh, the old norm where, where we had this big eastern enemy and uh and we had to put a lot of national effort into into uh deterring them you know, america is also being drawn they're the ones being drawn into the two-front situation because anything that has to go into the black sea or you know eastern europe is not available in southeast asia and and is is china more likely to try to invade taiwan if america is distracted by europe i think if putin is successful it's it's a big inducement like uh if if, if you're china if you're, if you're a chinese leader you might think am i going to squander one of the best chances that i have considering that you know the uh the americans are so distracted and it seems so irresolute um on the other hand maybe they're thinking uh, you know, the West is going to decline and we're on the upswing, so we might as well wait. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's not clear. It's definitely, it definitely would, I think it would increase uh, the chances, not necessarily because America is distracted, but because it it's, um, demonstrates a precedent that you can, you can get away with, with, with this sort of thing. Well, that's true. But I'd say even in both, on both counts, um, on both counts, uh, we find ourselves in a, in a, in a dangerous situation, but I don't, I don't know. It's like, you know, if, and I guess this is the fear, right? Like this would be bad for us would be if, well, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not going to make a conclusion about whether it'd be good or bad, but you know, if Ukraine goes and then Taiwan goes and then Germany says, you know what, like maybe we don't need to be like that tightly aligned with, you know, the United States and United Kingdom and um, not that they formally join like some new Warsaw Pact, but that Russian sphere, Russian and Chinese spheres of influence like grow at the end and, and can, you know, and basically do fall like dominoes. I mean, domino theory in principle doesn't have to be wrong. It's just in its application during the Cold War, it kind of you know, didn't, uh, didn't live up to the promise. Uh, how, how much of this do you think is Vladimir Putin wanting a legacy as opposed to what's really in Russia's best interests? Oh, I, I think, think it is in their interest. Cautious. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it is in their interest. You can go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, you know, like I, I've listened to some things on this and people are like, Oh, Putin's crazy. Like, this is crazy. Like, why would he do this? And it's like, well, what do you mean? He got away with it. And honestly, did anybody think something else was going to happen? I mean, in a lot of ways, he has the high, 
I mean, there's so much moral high ground in terms of, I mean, this is my next door neighbor. Americans have, you know, American politicians, elected officials in their words and actions have, you know, uh, you know, want to put their weapons on our doorstep. Um, you know, in these breakaway republics, you know, if, if we care about democracy and self-determination, like there are Russian speaking people in Eastern Ukraine that want to be with Russia or at least uh, not, or, you know, or, or in a more favorable relationship to Russia being denied that. I mean, like who's, who's going to war over that? Like what American soldier is, you know, willing to die for that? Nobody. Well, I mean, Biden is sending troops into uh, Poland. So we're sending more troops into Europe, which seems to be against our national best interest. Like it, it did seem for the, for the past five years that uh, NATO was going to wither away and die. And now we've got an increased economic and military commitment to an alliance, which may no longer be in our best interest. Any thoughts, Kyle? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of a very standard um, like right-wing dissident take. But again, like the problem that I keep coming back to is that the cold reality is that the, the, the countries with the largest alliances conquered the countries with the, with the smaller alliances. So, so like that, that just, that just breaks it down for me. Like, um, even when, when you look at, um, at like chips, chips are, are, are a big topic now, right? Um, so you have Taiwan semiconductors and, um, What's generally not understood is that Taiwan Semiconductors is kind of like a holding company. It, it's a company that coordinates a lot of resources from all around the world. Like their, their latest uh, extreme UV chips. Uh, I, I believe there's like a very large European company that, that supplies the, the fundamental component, the fundamental like um, like UV uh, radiation source for that. And it's, and it's a giant, you know, billion, billions of dollar project. And, you know, it, it involves coordination across space and time with a huge amount of Europeans and a huge amount of, of Americans and a huge amount of European assets and a huge amount of American assets and all that. And, you know, it's, it's good to have the larger alliance in peace. And it's also good to have the larger alliance in war, right? It, it makes, it makes a lot of things way easier. A lot of, of German and Japanese activity was trying to get around the fundamental fact that the allies kind of had the world and the Germans and Japanese had to kind of work around them all the time. Like, yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, but but when we say larger, I mean, uh, we're talking about industrial pr production, like war material, like ability to put soldiers on the ground equipped. Um, and let's just presume, I mean, I mean, the big question mark is what does China do? Like, just is, are, are these, are, are Russia, China, and the United States like three independent actors without unwilling to coordinate their activities? Or like if Russia and China were united, I mean, the nuclear arsenal of the Russians, the industrial production of the Chinese, I mean, does the West, is the West even larger anymore? I mean, do they have, there's, a, I, I did, I don't know if either of you read the Richard Hanania piece about this, but him talking about, you know, relative birth rates and what that says about the willingness of people to like send their children to war. I mean, how, what kind of manpower can the West muster really uh kyle who are you paying attention to these days particularly with regard to what's going on in europe um I think there's a guy named michael kaufman I, I follow like a bunch of um these what's called os int accounts like uh it's like an open source intelligence movement they they use like all kinds of data and they give you updates it's not necessarily all that useful um but it's definitely fascinating to to see things in real time there's a huge amount of data available to, to the um, to the layperson now, um, hmm. but really, I don't know. Um, I, I've been listening to some Atlantic Council podcasts and some uh, you know some a lot of like uh, retired CIA people have have, have podcasts and so I listen to them. Uh, not because I, I agree with all their perspectives, but because they seem like relatively well, well well informed and at least it tells you where the debate is. Um, yeah. But do you like, think yeah. do you think that they're the larger that the United States Empire is the largest the larger alliance? Uh, yes, yes. Like fundamentally, um, the U.S. plus EU plus um, I don't know Latin America. Like it's it's 
Well, and, and, and Japan, don't forget Japan, you know, Korea. Uh, the, the thing is that it, it's both very large and also very geographically distributed, which matters, right? Like, um, like a lot of the difficulties of, of Japan well, and Germany related to geography as well as to... to well, the, but the geography is favorable, presuming that the United States is able to control the seas, you know, but with like these supersonic missiles and there's only like 10 aircraft carriers. Yeah, I mean, it's way more than everybody else's, but, I mean, that's 10 missiles. I think the fundamental problem is that, um, like, n nowadays, I think that the real action is, is under the sea, not, not, not the aircraft carriers. And uh, it's a lot easier to kill than to protect, right? Like, um, it, took a, it, it, it took a bigger investment from the Allies to, to, to stop the U-boat threat than it took the Germans to to create the U-boats, and we're yeah. kind of in, in, in the yes. super U-boat era. So if China has to be maybe like three times as strong as America to stop America from just sinking all their all, all, uh, sinking their their trade routes, and they rely on trade routes more than more than we do. No, they rely on my, trade routes than we do. No, no, no. I understand, but my point is that you know at least what you what I've heard or you know the fear mongering about supersonic missiles developed oh, yeah, by yeah. the Russians is that. These carriers, I mean, it's they're no longer able to project that kind of power because they are, you, know, you talk about attack and defense, it just takes 12 of these missiles to take out multi-billion dollar, you know, plane, you know, aircraft carriers. Right. I, like, I read that article with, with uh, Hanania and Sue. Um, I think broadly it's wrong because... Uh, like the, these are these are basically a, a a fancy fancy ballistic missile, right? Like they're they're basically yeah. ballistic missiles, except that they do more maneuvering and they have like a much longer glide phase. Yeah. Um, and you know, basically everything you could do with them, you could do with the ballistic missiles. Only the ballistic missiles are faster, but also easier to intercept. But do we have the, the capacity to stop? Um, you know, a, a bunch of ICBM class missiles targeted on a carrier mm. i'm not sure we do yeah so i, I don't think that it changes that much but like I, but yeah. but so then if you're not able to basically park your bombing uh your bombers off the coast of shanghai and and hit their factories then they're going to grind you up in their ability to produce and arm hordes <clears throat> and maybe it's not that they're able to then mount their own invasion on united states soil but that eurasia is no longer if the u.s doesn't it can't guarantee the seas then what is the point of the united states from the point of view of the eu well china china creates a lot of hostility to uh, to itself like uh, as uncharismatic as the latest woke americans are the chinese somehow managed to be less charismatic than that um, so, like, kind of the purpose of the U.S. would be, uh, from the perspective of random countries around the world, would be to try to hedge against China. Um, and, like, if, if you add up, like, you add up EU plus U.S. plus Japan, you know, that's that's already bigger than bigger than China, like, yeah. Or, or, or yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that's well, true. Well, not, not in terms of people. But, you would need, you would, well, but even industrial production. Yeah. I think it's bigger China, than China. China has the factories. Yeah, but they're like seventy seventh in per capita income. I mean, they're not. They're yeah, a but third income, world country. Well, but they are. You, the United States was not wealthier per capita than Europe at the time of the World Wars. But yes, it was. Like the, the United States became the world's richest country per capita in the eighteen eighties. What did it? Oh, okay. All right, well, I stand corrected on that point, but I guess it doesn't change the fact that the United States income now is like so largely based on services and sort of like the legacy of their their control, you know, their control of the money supply that, you know, I don't think they can churn out, you know, the tanks. I partly agree and I partly don't. And, the, and here's where I partly don't, right? The best Chinese AI researchers, where are they? America. They're all working here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So 
the wealth of so we're just gonna drone them to death (laughs) i mean Um, i guess that's it right in in large part yeah we don't have to put troops on taiwan to defend taiwan we can use we can use technology to send missiles and, and bombs we don't have to put people in the way because our technology is so much better than china's kyle what were you saying Taiwan is a, is a difficult one because it's so close to China. But but yeah, like the, the broader point, um, yeah, like the wealth of the West is not illusory. This is this is like an intuition that, that you get from studying economics, um, and it like it sounds like uh, it sounds like you're you're being too confident or whatever. But the reality is that you know GDP actually does matter. It, it re- represents even if it's it's uh, it's quote unquote fake or misleading in some ways it ends up being being more relevant than you think in others. And so like the reality is that Chinese elites, especially the the very, very top intellectual elites, they want to have their children educated here. They want to be able to to, to come here. And that really matters, right? Um, and China can can stop this. China can obviously stop people from emigrating the same way that the Soviets stopped people from emigrating. But but uh, that creates like morale problems and, and coordination problems and all of that. Um, like the fact that that real estate in the U.S. is so expensive reflects, in a way, the fact that it, it's the world's premier destination for, for for people people who have the power and the wealth to choose wherever they want to go. Um, you know, the, the U.S. and 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 uh, allied countries, you know, very analogous countries like New Zealand and Canada and stuff like that, uh, you know, sweep up the lion's share of those. Um, well, I think it's been true. That's that has been true. Uh, but what I would say is that what Ukraine may, you know, sort of, listen, COVID, the election uh, of 2020, like the, the reaction to Donald Trump in 2016, these are these moments where like the mass drops from the regime and, you know, Ukraine lays bare the fact that the United States is not position to basically defend it, defend the periphery of its empire. And once that periphery, that edge is challenged, like you don't quite know like what kind of momentum will come off of that. And what I'm saying is that dry, you know, China and Russia together, which they never have seemed to manage to like truly unite I mean, like, because they are different civilizations and they don't have all the same interests. And, and maybe that's a key weakness of theirs. But it would seem to me that they ought that China, at a minimum, could take Taiwan with no serious response. I don't think America would send maybe more than drones in support. But like once Taipei is taken, they're done. There's no, you know, D-Day invasion coming from the United States to, to protect Taiwan. Right, but like, um, is, is China, like, uh, China is not more pleasant than the U.S. when it comes to COVID, right? So, like, all these sort of things that, that, that America is doing that are maybe missteps in terms of overreacting to COVID, um, they're, they're things that are echoed, you know, tenfold in China, and, you know, it, it, and they're also echoed in Europe, and they're, and they're also, you know, there's, there's not a place that really comes off looking much better than, than America out of this catastrophe. It's, it, it, it sort of degrades the quality of life everywhere, but it's not like, you know, oh, there are no uh, COVID restrictions in South, in South Africa. I don't know if that's true. Or, or, uh, or Korea, Kenya, Japan. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah you, you're not going to go there. Like the places that don't have any restrictions um, relative to America have other problems that are worse. And the places that, that, that are, um, you know, doing better in terms of COVID numbers are more restricted, like like China, Japan, East Asia, and more broadly. But I don't mean necessarily it's about their response per se. It's that there are these issues that if, um, like, the social trust and social cohesion. I think that's yeah, what you're they, talking they, about. Yeah, it's dramatically changed the perception of the regime. It's not this thing that, you know, I see the flat. Like, I mean, I'm a guy that. I stop like national anthem. I stop wherever I am. I mean, it's hat off, hand, you know, on the heart, face the flag. Like I stood the, I said the pledge of allegiance proudly every day in school. Like 
And now I see those things as like, they, they kind of disgust me. And it, it sort of upsets me that I ever like saw it as, it's like not the American government is not representative of the American people. And therefore, like it has its mercenary forces, you know, that it uses to do these operations in the Middle East. And, and it has its weapon, you know, it has its technology, but it does not have the soldiers. It does not have the ability to mobilize the United States people uh, um, to, you know, South. South Korea, I don't think Americans are going back for Korea. And if Japan was to fall into the hands of the United, uh, uh, like, or fall into the sphere of influence of China, uh, who, who's going to go to war over that? Are we really, I mean, without like some, I'm not going to say false flag, but some sort of like direct provocation against, you know, the American people. Um, I, I think like the will of the, the ability of the United States to project power is way more fragile than it has seemed in the recent past like in the past 20 years like since since the end of the cold war right you're talking about steadily dropping social trust and social cohesion yeah that which undermines the ability to make war and, and so uh, mm -hmm. anyway and and kyle do you think that we've uh, experienced steadily dropping social trust and social cohesion which uh makes this country weaker yeah, um, no doubt of that. I mean, when you see but, countries but, like yeah, Northeast really... Asia and how they react to COVID by, you know, pulling together and being individually responsible, it's such a dramatic contrast to Western individualism. Sorry, Kyle, back to you. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, but like, this, it's a very broad story, right? Like, uh, you saw a whole lot of East Asian countries do really fantastically in terms of their not their their their, their death numbers, and you also saw like pretty consistent results across the entire West. So we can't blame anything recent for this. It's, it's a much bigger story than anything that's happened. And, you know, it, it, it's a story of two civilizations, really. Like it's a you know, divergence going back many thousands of years. It's not, it's not like, uh, you know, the latest polarization numbers caused this. Uh, this um, no, I, I'm just saying that we, within, within the context of, you know, like uh, this 50 year period, there's just been a steady, and it did, like you said, it, it didn't happen with COVID. It, this is the latest instance of the breakdown, um, the breakdown of, of trust in the government, like the identity, the, the social cohesion in the American people and, and willingness to, you know, engage in warfare that's not like deemed sort of absolutely necessary, like a, an assault on us, you know, which... So I just think that I think that the American appetite to go defend much outside the, you know, they would probably 